Well, happy Mother's Day, everybody. <laughs> Is there no moms here today? Hey, I, I just want to take a second to say I'm incredibly, incredibly grateful for, for the moms in my life. Um, I'm grateful for my mom and uh, for the part that she played in my life. I'm grateful for my wife and the incredible mom that she is to our two little girls. And uh, I'm grateful for my sister. My sister just had her first child, so just a few months ago. And so this is her first Mother's Day. But I'm also grateful for the moms here at Lake Sawyer. Um, Your heart, your passion, the love that you have for your children uh, is, uh, it's contagious. And uh, your efforts day in and day out are making a profound impact, not just in the lives of your children, but in the lives of so many, the way that you love them well, uh, more importantly, the way that you love the Lord well is, uh, is an inspiration to all of us. And so thank you from the bottom of my heart to all of the moms here at Lake Sawyer Church. Just want to take a second. Let's give a big round of applause. It's everybody. Big round of applause to the moms here in the house. Uh, this, this morning, we're continuing in our series Free. Matter of fact, over the past five weeks, we've been talking about this concept of finding freedom. And to do so, we've really kind of dealt with some difficult topics. We've talked about how we slow down. We talked about how we look back at our lives and our past and how we also take ownership of what's been done to us so that we can move forward. And as I've talked to many of you over the last couple of weeks, there's been sort of the general consensus that what we've talked about has been, has been some heavy stuff. Like it's, it's caused us to look inside, to look internally at some of the things that we would just rather ignore, some of the things that we would just rather brush underneath the rug than have to come face to face. When we sit with our past, when we sit with what's been done to us, it's, it's, it's a difficult weight to carry. And all that we've talked about over the last uh, four weeks has really led us to this fifth week and what we're going to talk about this morning. As we looked back, it sort of leads us to where we're going today. And I'm really excited about where we're going because I think there's a lot of hope and a lot of just uh, uh, encouragement as we turn the corner here. And to do that, we're going to jump right into the Gospel of Luke. It's one of the four Gospels in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, that tell us about the life and the ministry of Jesus. And we join with the story here in Luke chapter 8. We're, we're told that Jesus is in Galilee. And at this point in Jesus' life, when Jesus shows up somewhere, large crowds of people show up. Like people want to see Jesus. They want to hear from him. They're, they're, they're interested in what he might say or what he might do. And so Jesus is in Galilee. Crowds have shown up. And among the crowd of people is a father. And the father is deeply concerned about the condition of his daughter. She's back at home. She's really ill. She's not sure if she's going to make it through. And so she comes to Jesus and she pleads with Jesus to go back to his house with him that maybe he can bring healing to his daughter. And Jesus agrees. Jesus begins to follow with this man to his house. And it's on the journey to this man's house that Jesus is interrupted in something else Happens, And that's where we're going to pick up here in Luke 8, beginning in verse 42. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. So we're told at the very beginning of this verse that this crowd is pressing up against Jesus. The crowd is literally crushing Jesus. And among the crowd of people is a woman who has experienced menstrual bleeding for 12 years. Now, in the first century Jewish religious system, this is a big deal. Like the Jewish system was built and structured around this very key principle, keeping people pure. Purity was a driving factor of the religious system. And so they did what they could to keep people pure and holy. And the best way to ensure that people were pure and holy was to keep them away from people who were dirty and profane in their culture. And when that boundary is crossed, when people cross from 
pure and holy to dirty and profane, the individual becomes contaminated. Contamination is the byproduct. And when you were contaminated, you too were now considered to be dirty. And when that happened, there was a whole other set of laws that defined what you had to do as an individual to become clean once again. You had to fulfill these uh, these laws and these practices to find cleanliness. This is the context in the reality that is important for us to understand to really fully grasp the significance of what's happening here in Luke 8. Let's get back to the story of the woman. According to these first century Jewish laws, which you can read about in Leviticus 15, when a woman was experienced experiencing menstrual bleeding, she was considered unclean until it stopped. But not only that, anyone that she encountered, anyone that she was around would also be considered unclean. She was contaminating or she would contaminate other people. And for 12 years, just think about that for a second. For 12 years, this is her reality like this is the tension that she lives in. For 12 years, she's been set apart. She has no community. She has no other people who want to be near her. She has no one to share life with. Everyone keeps her apart. And as a result, the only thing that she experiences in this season is loneliness and isolation and shame and pain. Now you might be listening to me say this and think, well, this is just absolutely barbaric. Like, uh, this is absolutely barbaric to treat a woman like this. And here's the thing, you're right. I mean, this is an incredibly barbaric way to treat another person. But I think there's something, there's something underneath what we're seeing that still is a part of us in our world today. So let me ask you this question. Have you ever encountered someone have you ever crossed paths with someone, said hello, shook a hand with someone, and the first thing that you wanted to do when you were apart from that person was wash your hands? Like, have you ever been like around someone and you try to be friendly, you try to, you know, put a smile on your face and do the right things, but as soon as you're away from that person, you're like, give me, okay, give me a baby wipe, get me, get me some hand sanitizer, just get me something, because in that moment, you feel dirty, you feel unclean. Now, let's just be honest, I, I've experienced that before in my life. I'm sure you can relate to that reality as well. There was something just creepy or dirty or off-putting about that person that made us worry that we might be contaminated. And this is her life. Like, this is what she lives with. Like, this is her reality. But then she hears that Jesus has come to town. And the words out about Jesus, people know what Jesus can do. And she's thinking, you know, if I could get near Jesus, if I can get close enough to Jesus, maybe he can bring the healing that I need in my life. Like there's this hopefulness in this moment, but it's held with this reality that she knows. She knows she has no business, no place to be around other people. She knows that if she goes and sees Jesus, she's gonna risk contaminating everybody. And so she's got this like part of her that wants to experience the potentiality of healing, but she has the other part of her that's filled with rejection and shame. And she knows her place in culture, in society of that day. But despite all of that, she figures, you know what? I'm gonna travel to see Jesus. I want to be with Jesus. She comes and she gets to the people. The first thing she notices is the massive crowd. Like there's there's thousands of people around Jesus. And she, again, she knows she's not supposed to be here. She knows that, that, that she's gonna risk contaminating everyone, but she thinks, you know what? It doesn't matter. At this point, I'm gonna force my way to Jesus. I'm gonna get to Jesus because I want to be near him. I want to tap into his healing power in my life. And as she forces her way through the crowd, she essentially contaminates the entire crowd. And this is a major problem in the Jewish religious system. 
And when she gets to Jesus, when she finally gets there, the text says that she reaches out and she touches his cloak. And as she touches his cloak, immediately, immediately she's healed. Immediately everything changes for her. This is good news for her. Like life is different now because of this moment. The problem is Jesus is now contaminated. Suddenly, Jesus stops. And he says these words in Luke 8, verse 45. He says, who touched me? Who touched me? Jesus asks. Like in that moment, instantly, he knows that someone has touched him. And what he wants to know is who was it? Who was it that touched me? And no one in the crowd fesses up. Like I, like I literally imagine they begin to like, like judge each other with their eyes. Like, did you touch Jesus? Did you, did you do it? Like, I didn't, I didn't touch Jesus. Did you touch? No, I didn't touch Jesus. Well, it must have been you. No, 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 it wasn't me. I didn't touch Jesus. Like, no one fesses up to touching Jesus. So then Peter states the obvious in the second half of verse 45. Master, he says, the people are crowding and pressing against you. Like, um, Jesus, there's literally thousands of people touching you right now. Like, there's a lot of people touching you. Like, what do you mean someone touched me? But the thing is, Jesus understands. He knows that this touch is different. So verse 46, he says, someone touched me. Someone touched me. And I know that power has gone out from me. And as Jesus is saying these words, I have to imagine this woman is praying. She's praying that she, she won't be exposed. She's probably hoping that Jesus will just forget this whole matter. He'll just continue on the road down to the man's house to help out his daughter. She wants to stay in hiding because she's contaminated. Because she's brought this to other people. She wants to stay in hiding because she's ashamed. And isn't that what shame does to us in our lives? It encourages us to hide. You see, shame is a feeling. Shame is a feeling that we experience when we do something that we think is wrong or something that we think is improper or something that we think is bad or shame happens when we see something. It's not just that when we do something, when we see something in our lives that we think is wrong, that we think is improper, that we think is bad. And what shame is, it's a feeling rooted in fear that we have that other people would respond negatively if they knew these hidden parts of us in our lives. We hide because we don't want to be exposed. Now the thing is, we weren't born with shame. That's something that we learn. It's something that is taught to us. And I, I see it in my kids. I, I even reflect in my own life. Like a couple of weeks ago, I was like scrolling through the picture albums on my phone. And, and you know, I don't know if you're like me, but you have got a lot of pictures that recount a lot of history and life on your phone. I'm scrolling through and I come to these pictures of my kids when they were super young. And like, there is no shame. Like none whatsoever. Like my youngest, she went through this like season where she thought the coolest and most fashionable thing you could do was legitimately wear like a dozen headbands on your head. And so I have all these pictures of her like going out shopping at the mall with like headbands on her head and she's just like strutting her stuff. Like it doesn't matter. Like there's no shame there. She doesn't care what anyone else thinks. Like I look back at my childhood and some of my pictures and now I'm like, oh, what was I thinking? But like then I was like, I, no shame. And we don't do that. Like when you're kids, when we're kids or your kids, when you're young, you don't experience shame. It's not part of our normal experience as kids. It's something that has been taught to us. The older we get, the more we're aware of the things that we shouldn't do. Or maybe it's someone has said something to us, has told us that, well, that's bad. That, that, that's, that's inappropriate. That's something that you shouldn't do. And so we've been taught to cover those things up. We've been taught to go into hiding. And here's a sad reality. I need you to hear this. If you've, if you've never heard nothing else I've said so far, just listen to this. Some of us have become really, really good at hiding. Some of us have become really, really good 
at hiding our lives, hiding our shame. We hide it a lot because we're afraid to be exposed. And my guess is if you grew up in any sort of religious system, you probably experience more shame than others. Because religion, with all of its laws and all of its rules, often teach us that we need to hide. And it's not the goal of religion. It's not what it's set out to achieve, but it's, it's at the end of the day, it's what often happens. And this woman, she had so much pain, so much hurt, and so much shame that she wanted to hide. But she's quickly realizing that this is no longer a possibility Verse 47, then the woman, seeing that she couldn't go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Guys, this woman is scared to death. She's filled with fear and trembling, but she chooses to fess up. She comes and she falls at Jesus's feet and she tells him his story or her story. And as she tells her story and she pleads for forgiveness, she, she exposes herself to the entire crowd. Now everyone knows her secret. Everyone knows that they too have be, become contaminated. She's vulnerable in this moment. And I have to imagine She's completely uncomfortable. And she's probably waiting. She's waiting. She's waiting to be yelled at. She's waiting to be condemned. She's waiting to be uh, judged. She's waiting for the disgust of the crowd and Jesus. But then Jesus said to her in verse 48, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Daughter, he says. I found this fascinating. That is the only time in the entirety of scripture that Jesus refers to a woman as daughter, which is incredibly significant. Like if you get, if you, if you think through everything that she's gone through, the struggle, her reality, the lack of community, the lack of other people speaking life into her life. If you think through everything, how powerful are Jesus' words in this moment as he looks at her and he says, daughter, essentially my, my child, it is a word that denotes belonging, like my child, you were more. You are more than the lies your shame says about you. You are more than being simply a person who is unclean. You, daughter, are my child. You belong with me. I love you. You are a part of my family and your faith, he says. Your faith has healed you. That's not what Jesus was supposed to say. He wasn't supposed to tell her that his, her faith had healed herself. What she was supposed to say, or Jesus was supposed to say, was clearly defined in that religious system. Like what Jesus was supposed to say was, was clear. Everyone knew what Jesus was supposed to say. What Jesus was supposed to tell the woman is now you need to go home. You need to cleanse yourself. And after seven days, you will then go to the temple. When you go to the temple, you need to take with you two pigeons to offer up as a sacrifice. One as a sin offering, the other as a burnt offering. And then once you've cleansed yourself, once you've waited seven days, once you've gone to the temple, once you've done these two sacrificial offerings, then and only then would you be clean. That's what Jesus was supposed to say. But instead, what he said was, your faith has healed you. Now, this isn't to imply that somehow this woman has healed herself. It was her trust in Jesus that brought, to, brought about her healing. If she had not trusted Jesus, she wouldn't have come to see him. 
If she not trusted Jesus, she wouldn't have pushed her way to the front of the crowd. If she had not trusted Jesus, she wouldn't have risked exposing herself and coming out of hiding. But because she trusted Jesus, she experienced healing. And what Jesus says to her is go in peace. Now this word peace here is a, is a statement of being. This woman has not experienced peace in a long, long time. For 12 years, this woman experienced nothing but pain and shame, no peace. Like that was her reality. But now Jesus says to her, it's all over. Woman, you are now at peace. You are clean. And she, she didn't even have to go to the temple to receive her cleansing. And right there, I think this is something we miss. So often we think what gets Jesus in trouble is the things that he did. Like he comes into the temple and he overthrows the tables. Like that, that's what got Jesus in trouble. But in reality, often what got Jesus in trouble was not what he did. What got Jesus in trouble was the things he claimed about himself. I mean, think about it. Jesus here. He healed this woman. And for us, without the context, without being first century Jews, like we see that, we're like, oh, that's amazing. Like Jesus healed this woman, but the people who had experienced, the people who witnessed what happened, they would think, yes, Jesus healed the woman. That wouldn't have been their hangup. Their hangup would have been the things that Jesus claimed. Not the action of the healing, but the way the healing came about. Jesus cleansed this woman. He brought healing without the temple, without the sacrifices, without any of the purity laws. And that's what people would have been stuck on. And that's the thing. Jesus is making claims all the time, all throughout scripture, that gets him in trouble. Not so much what he did, but what he claimed about himself. Matter of fact, Jesus in, in Luke 7, in Luke 7, he makes a claim that he could do something that only religion was supposed to be able to do. He says to a woman, your sins are forgiven. And again, the crowd's hearing that and they're like, who does this guy think he is? Like, Jesus, you can't forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. And like, the people back then do the same thing that we do today. They put God in a box. It's like, no, God is the only one who can forgive sins, but God can only forgive sins at the temple. When these certain religious purity laws are carried out, when these certain practices are played out, only then can a person experience the forgiveness of sins. Jesus is like, oh, I'm glad you brought up the temple because I have something else to say about the temple. He says this in Matthew 12 in verse six. He says, I tell you, Something greater than the temple is here. Guys, in the Jewish religious context, there is nothing greater than the temple. The temple is the place where heaven and earth meet. The temple is the place that a person goes to when they want to interact or when they want something from the divine. And suddenly Jesus shows up and a claim he makes in the New Testament. He says, that temple, I'm going to tear it down. You don't need the temple anymore because you have me. Those claims or what got Jesus in trouble. Jesus, you don't need a building anymore. You have me. I, I am where heaven and earth meet. I can do the things that the temple could never do for you. And with his words, with his claims, Jesus tore down, he tore apart the religious approach and replaced it with himself. You see, it was no longer a purity system. It was now about a person. It was no longer about rules and rituals and laws. It would now be about love. And in dismantling the religious system, Jesus begins to call people out of hiding and shame and guilt. And he offers in place of that grace and forgiveness, healing life 
and peace. And then to prove that he had the power and authority to do these things, he died and then he rose again. And with his death, he put to death an old system, a system that was ruled by guilt and shame and laws. And in it, with his resurrection, he has set all of creation free. Jesus rose to bring about a new way, a new life ushered by a new reality. And this Jesus movement was never intended to be another religion. But sadly, that's exactly what it's turned into. I mean, over the centuries, this Jesus movement has become another religion. But if you look and you go back to the earliest followers of Jesus, what they didn't have is they didn't have systems. What they didn't have is they didn't have structures. They didn't even have the Bible that we have today. What these first Christians had were other people. People whose lives have been incredibly changed by the power and the grace and the love of Jesus. People just like this woman who experienced pain and shame but yet trusted Jesus enough to come out of hiding and find healing and life. You see, we all have parts of us that we hide. We have parts of ourselves that we are ashamed of. Some of us have been carrying around this shame for a long time and there is pain that comes with it and that shame and that pain prevents us from living a life at peace. And there is no amount of religion, there is no amount of obedience that will ever take away your shame. It takes another person. A person who loves you, who's willing to accept you just as you are. You see, one day, on a street in Galilee, there was a woman who was overcome with shame. But then she encountered what? A person. Not a religion. She encountered Jesus, and everything in her life changed. And then Jesus asked her to do something. It's the first thing Jesus asked her to do. Jesus asked her to come out of hiding. And here's why that's so important. The only way to be free from shame is to be loved in spite of it. Like the only way to experience freedom from our shame and our, and our pain in our life is to experience love from other people in spite of what we have done. Because the truth is you can't take shame away. You can't pretend what brought about your shame didn't happen. It happened. And so the only way to move past your shame and your pain and you experience in your life is to be forgiven. Or in many cases... It's to forgive someone else. You see, forgiveness is a choice to love despite what has happened. The Apostle Paul, he says these words in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. He says this, but God, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners. Like why we were still like messed up and have all these wounds and this pain and these, and these warts and we make all these mistakes. Like while we were still sinners, guys, Christ died for us. He died for you. He died for you, you, for me. He died for us. And the thing is, you and I have parts of our lives that are shameful to us. Whether or not we should be ashamed of it is really irrelevant. The reality is we experience shame because of something that has happened in our lives. And what we do in face of that shame is we choose to hide. We don't want anyone else to see us. 
We don't want anyone else to know what's really going on, but freedom is found when we come out of hiding long enough to hear Jesus say to us, you are forgiven. We come out of hiding long enough to hear Jesus say, I love you. When we come out of hiding long enough to hear Jesus say, be at peace. And when those words, when those words settle into the deepest part of our being, when those words rest the very center of who we are, we will experience freedom. Those words set us free. See, the thing about love and forgiveness is this. It's not earned. It's something that one person gives to another. We, we don't understand it. We can't always make sense of it. The only thing we can do is receive it. Which I think is why Jesus said to this woman, your faith has healed you. You see, it wasn't because she believed the right thing. It wasn't because she did the right thing. It's because she trusted in Jesus' love for her. She trusted in his forgiveness, in his healing, in his cleansing of her life. And because of that trust, everything changed. And that same gift is available to you today. Will you trust? Will you trust Jesus enough to come out of hiding and let him speak words of life over your life? Will you let those words settle into your heart? Will you allow those words to set you free? Jesus wants you to experience freedom but you gotta be willing to surrender to experience the gift he wants to give you. Let's pray. God, I thank you for people, for the lives of people just like this woman who is willing to expose everything about her life to get to you who is willing to deal with her past and her shame to find freedom in her future. And Jesus, I know that we all have our scars. We have our past, we have our, our pain, we carry with us our shame. God, and I ask that you would help us right now trust in what you want to do in our lives enough that we're willing to expose ourselves, that we're willing to come out of hiding, to hear your words. Be at peace. You are forgiven. You my child, daughter, son, you are loved. Thank you for your endless pursuit of us and it's in the name of your son, Jesus, that we pray all these things. Amen.